perhaps because in Foucault's terms, prison is a place of confinement for the body, not a place of repair or development for the mind. It is literally a form of institutionalized coercion for the body. I ask him when I read you a passage where one of the laborers, having got it into his idea that some equality should be available within the field of the means of production, is asking an agent who is offering the farmer's buttons to pick something. He's asking the agent to see his license. And it's an interesting little narrative development in relation to the worker asking for the rights he is supposed to have and the agent letting him know what his rights are. What you paying? He asked. Well, can't tell exactly. About 30 cents, I guess. Why can't you tell? You took the contract, didn't you? That's true, the cocky man said. But it's key to the price. Might be a little more, might be a little less. Floyd stepped out ahead. He said quietly, I'll go, mister. You're a contractor and you got a license. You just show your license and then you give us an order to go to work and where and when and how much we'll get and you sign that, and we'll all go. The contractor turned, scowling. You tell me how to, how to run my own business? Floyd said. If we're working for you, it's our business too. Well, you ain't telling me what to do. I told you I need men. Floyd said angrily. You didn't say how many men, and you, and you didn't say what you'd pay. God damn it, I don't know yet. If you don't know, you got no right to hire men. I got a right to run my business my own way. If you men want to sit here on your ass, okay. I'm getting, I'm getting men for a teller country. Going to need a lot of men. Floyd turned to the crowd of men. They were standing up now, looking quietly from one speaker to the other. Floyd said, Twice now I fell for that. Maybe he needs a thousand men. He'll give five thousand there, and he'll pay fifteen cents an hour. And you poor bastards have to take it, because you'll be hungry. If he wants to hire men, let, her, let him hire him, and write it out and say what he's going to pay. Ask to see his license. He ain't allowed to contract men without a license. The contractor turned to the Chevrolet and called, Joe! His companion looked out, and then swung the car door open and stepped out. He wore riding breeches and lace boots. A heavy pistol hol holster hung on a cartridge belt around his waist. That, thanks, Asim, was great. That's almost like the classical cinema shot that signals the arrival of violence. You can see it in your mind's eye. The door of the car opening, the cowboy boot, the heavy belt, the big stick, the gun. This discussion is finished. The effect is the impact on your body. At the conclusion of the Grapes of Wrath, it's extraordinary to arrive at this moment. There is no shelter. They are completely unmoored, the remains of this family. They're in a barn, in a storm, in the middle of nowhere. They no longer have a car. They no longer have money. They no longer have any idea where they are going. They're in absolute unbounded space without home, without direction home without money, without institutional security, in the grip of terror, and Steinbeck concludes his story thus, upon finding a man in the barn on the brink of death through starvation. Rose of Sharon whispered, will, will you all go out? The rain whisked lightly on the roof. Ma leaned forward, and with her palms, she brushed the tussled hair back from her daughter's forehead, and she kissed her on the forehead. Ma got up quickly. Come on, you fellas, she called. You come out in the tool shed. Ruthie opened her mouth to speak. Hush, Mom said. Hush and get. She, uh, she herded them through the door, drew the boy with her, and she closed the squeaking door. For a minute, Rosa Sharon sat still in the whispering barn. Then she hoisted her tired body up and drew the comfort about her. She moved slowly to the corner and stood looking down at the wasted face, into the wide, frightened eyes. Then, slowly, she lay down beside him. She shook his head slowly from side to side. Rosa, Sh uh, Rosa Sharon loosened one side of the blanket and bared her breast. You got to, she said. She squirmed closer and pulled his head close. There, she said, there. Her hand moved behind his head and supported it. Her fingers moved gently in his hair. She looked up and across the barn and her lips came together and smiled mysteriously. The only salvation. Steinbeck's final scene offers some sense of communi community, but it's radical. It is not simply friendship. Rose of Sharon does not know this man. She has never met him before. It is not family. He is not her family. It is not brotherhood because she is a young woman and he is an old man. It is a sense of absolute community among all people instigated as a transgression of the prescribed limits of the body. 
this is not the done thing. In the novel, a family sets out on the road to California and is decimated, eviscerated, destroyed. In its stead, Steinbeck offers a collective family, bonded by a sense of kindred suffering, by shared humanness, but a radical humanness. Now, re recalling um, Engels' critique of, of Malthus and saying he's destroyed the notion of kinship, human, you know, the, at the level of words. There's something in what Steinbeck is doing here that's far more radical. A collective based upon sharing rather than hoarding. Essay, a purse by. Who is that? Basel. Okay, this is Berkeley's uh, quote. It means to be is to be perceived, and uh, this is mean. This means that a person only exists if other people perceive and interact with him or her. Uh, and this idea opposes Descartes' view of existence, which is, as he said. I think, therefore, I am. Excellent. Thank you. So the idea is opposed to Descartes' notion of existence, which I know I exist because I know I exist. I think, therefore, I am, so I know I exist. Berkeley's notion is, no, that you know you exist because other people see you. You know yourself through the experience of other people. So it is a sense of collective as opposed to being just a single subject. We are intersubjective at some fundamental level. Teachers know this for a fact in Marianne Phyllis. Marco will confirm this. You walk into a lecture theater, you say, good morning. You say good morning five times, you begin to wonder if you actually exist. So imagine that was your life in which no one recognized you. So there is something to what Berkeley says. Um, Tom Joad is leaving his mother just before the end of the penultimate scene of the novel. He, is, he has suffered the consequences of running against the hegemony, the institutionalized hegemony. And um, he's, he's articulating, and he's not an articulate man, he's trying to articulate exactly what he has learned in life, what he has learnt on this journey to California and, and what it might mean for the future. Um, Hedia. Look, Emma, I've been all day and all night hiding alone. Guess who I've been thinking about? Casey. He talked a lot, used to bother me, but now I've been thinking what he said, and I can remember all of it. Says one time he, he went out in the wilderness to find his own soul, and he found he didn't have no soul that was his own. Says he found he just got a little bit be piece of a great big soul. Says a wilderness ain't no good, cause his little piece of a soul wasn't no good less it was with the rest, and was whole. Funny how I remember. Didn't think I was even listening. But I know now, a fella ain't no good alone. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I gotta think him, Ma. Most of the preaching is about the poor we shall have always with us. And if you got nothing, why? Just fold your hands and to hell with it. You're gonna get ice cream on gold plates when you're dead. I've been thinking how it was in the government camp, how our folks took care of themselves. And if there was a fight, they fixed it themselves. And there wasn't no cops waggling their guns, but there was better order than them cops ever give. I've been wondering why we can't do that all over. Throw out the cups that ain't our people. All work together for our own thing. All farm our own land. And then his last comment to his mother, knowing that he won't see her again, Zama. Tom laughed uneasily. Well, maybe like Casey says, a fella ain't got a soul of his own, but only a piece of a big one. And then, then what, Tom? Then it don't matter. Then I'll be all around in the dark. I'll be everywhere, wherever you look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. If Casey knowed why, I'll be in the way guys yell when they're mad, and I'll be in the way kids laugh when they're hungry, and they know supper's ready. And when our folks eat the stuff they raise and live in the houses they build, why, I'll be there, see? I have it on very good authority that Cornell University is about justice among men. Um, quotation from a speech from 1948 by Edmund Day, the then president of Cornell, Asil. I would say that the university has been conspicuous in its continuing efforts to demonstrate the interrelations and interactions of practical, social, and moral knowledge, understanding, and competence. There has never been the disposition here to carve these areas of intelligence apart 
to speak of practical intelligence on the one hand, of social intelligence on another, and of moral intelligence on still another, as if a man or woman did not, in very life, not these varieties together. Furthermore, their aim together should be to establish common justice among men and women. That is what uh, John Steinbeck attempts to write about in The Grapes of Wrath, to provide a vision on a series of levels, individual, social, political, cultural, about what it might mean or how it might be possible to have the concept of justice among men and women. Assuaging terror through empathy, approaching economics through the notion of justice, providing shelter as shared community, something that Obama is trying to do now with his health care bill. As we move towards such justice, move towards it, dragging the storm of progress with us, we move towards Steinbeck's time, or a time full of knowing. And it will be stories that get us there. They guide us. They are community. I think the last words of Steinbeck to Ridden. The migrant people, scuttling for work, scrabbling to live, looked always for pleasure, dug for pleasure, manufactured pleasure, and they were hungry for amusement. Sometimes amusement lay in speech, and they climbed up their lives with jokes. And it came about in the camps along the roads, on the ditch banks be beside the streams, under the sycamores, that the storyteller grew into being, and the people gathered in the low firelight to hear the gifted ones. And they listened while the tales were told, and their participation is what made the stories great. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all of you for, for reading those parts. We've recorded it and we'll make copies and you have a copy as a memento of the time that you read and participated in The Grapes of Wrath and made the story great. So thank you very much. <laughs>